Everyone has a story. Pretty crazy evening. Hustle and see the fire that has fallen. We all take a different path and face different hurdles. I'm your host, Sarah Strackhouse, and in this show, I get to interview inspiring women who are dedicated to making change. The world is tough, so be tough. Welcome to the Strackhouse. Yes. Well, welcome to our house where you can feel like you're not alone because someone else has gone through something similar. That's exactly what I want you to take away from the show. And today's show, I'm so excited to announce our guest, Yael Averbush. She's not only a trailblazer for female athletes, but for women in general. Yael, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. I'm honored to be on the show. Well, I want to jump right in and talk a little bit about playing soccer. Uh, tell us a little bit about playing soccer in college and then that step towards uh, playing professionally. Yeah, so it was always my dream since I was nine to be a professional soccer player. I really had no idea what that would mean, but I always wanted to go to UNC and represent the Tar Heels, and I wanted to be a professional soccer player. I had it written in my journal from a really young age. So for me, it was really interesting because on one hand, I was living my childhood dreams, and I got the opportunity to play college soccer at UNC, and then following that, I signed my first professional contract for Sky Blue FC, in WPS, which was the women's league at the time. Uh, but still, I realized at those points that those accomplishments didn't ever make it feel like smooth sailing. It's mm -hmm. always, you know, we're always a work in progress as athletes, as people. So there were still the same ups and downs. And it was really kind of eye opening for me to realize, you know, this is awesome. I'm so proud of achieving these things, but the journey continues. Yeah, absolutely. Did you know at one point, you know, was there a turning point where you're like, I'm going to play pro? This is it. Oh, you know, it's weird because when I think back, I always thought I was going to, which I, I had no reason to. I didn't even know what it meant to be a pro athlete at a young age. But I always believed from a very early point after I started playing the sport that I would and could be a pro player. And part of it was just learning and asking people who had done it or coaches who are experts, you know, what does it take? And I felt like I had really good resources and support where I grew up in North Jersey. And so I never really had that aha moment where I was like, oh, yes, I can do it. I kind of always, for some reason, thought I could do it, which now that I look back is is crazy. But it's also <laughs> really important part, I think, of achieving any goal is to actually just have this underlying knowledge that you will, you will find a way to do it. Absolutely. And it's that hard work that you put in to get there. And it's such a big part of it. Um, tell me a little bit about what it was like when the Women's League closed here in America. Yeah, so I played three professional seasons uh, in WPS, like I said, and then really I was training in the off season uh, with a bunch of players from the league, actually, and I had been planning to play for the team in Atlanta the upcoming season, so I had that all set. I was preparing for the season, and we went to get a, get water at a little bit of water break in the pickup game we were playing, and we checked our email, or somebody checked their email, and they were like, you guys, there's no more league. We were all very shocked. I mean, we knew there were difficulties and some some conflict kind of behind the scenes, but I don't think any of us really considered that there might just not be a league. And that wasn't something that I had experienced as a player. You know, a lot of players in the history of women's soccer in this country have left college and known that they had to go overseas or find a place to play because there wasn't a professional women's league here for a long time. But for me, that was all I knew ever since I came out of college. It was here and it was great. So it was it was a blow. I think we all felt pretty responsible and, and like it failed under our watch in some sense. And then also we're left with the challenge of, OK, what do we do now? Do we want to keep playing and go find an opportunity overseas or how does this all work? Right. So what led you to actually going overseas and after kind of feeling that blow and talking with everyone? Well, similarly to how I, for some reason, just knew I was going to be a professional soccer player <laughs> as a young kid, I didn't really have a question in my mind of what I was going to do. I knew I had to find a professional team to play for, um, but it wasn't as easy as I thought it might be. I actually had a short stint where I went to go play for a, a Russian club, and it was a very bad life experience. I was mm -hmm. just there for a month, but I did not like it. I didn't, uh, I didn't feel safe. I was injured for for some of it. It was just really, really tough. Wow. So I came home after a month and then spent the summer actually playing for a semi-pro team in New Jersey and trying to find a club. And I had a very good agent at the time and it was just really difficult. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of club 
don't know American players or didn't, I would say back then, I think it's changed a lot. And they're just, you know, a lot of Americans were trying to go abroad and there just weren't that many spots. So I finally did find a club in Sweden in Gothenburg and ended up having a wonderful experience. I played there for a year and a half, but it was certainly a life adventure and something that wasn't easy to do uh, by any means. Yeah, absolutely. So what made you decide to actually leave from playing overseas and and what was kind of going through your head during that period of time? And I know that was kind of around the time that you had the idea for launching your company. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I, I, like I said, I really enjoyed playing in Gothenburg, Sweden, but I, I always kind of knew that it was, this was not going to be my home. I wasn't going to build a life and play eight years in Sweden. I always intended to come back to the US. Mm -hmm. And actually after my first little stint in Sweden, I had a time period and a kind of a deadline where I needed to decide if I was going to re-sign my contract for the full next year. And there were these rumors about a new league for the for the women in the US. And it was just such early stages. I had no idea what it was going to be. There was no name. I didn't know what teams were going to be involved. So I didn't want to take a risk. And I said, okay, I'm going to stay in Sweden. And that was actually the first year of NWSL. Wow. And so I missed the first season of NWSL. And um, but like I said, I always intended to come back to the U.S. and play. Right. So after that, I had a great experience in Sweden. And I was then very ready, though, to come home. Oh, wow. OK. Well, tell me a little bit about launching your company and kind of how that started, too. Yeah, so while I was in Sweden, like I kind of alluded to, it was uh, although it was a wonderful experience, it was really lonely and it, it's difficult to go live in another country. Yeah. I had um, a couple American teammates, an English teammate, and everyone was really friendly and welcoming. So I did have friends. but. It was lonely. There's a time difference, so you can't really easily connect with friends right, and family right. back home. And just outside of playing and training, I had these whole days. Like if I had a day off, I literally had nothing to do. So I actually went out and I started to film these little backyard skill challenges, is what I called them. <laughs> and I would put the videos on YouTube. This was kind of before. This makes me feel really old. But it was kind of before <laughs> um, before people were really using social media to post videos, and so. From that, that was the very early stages of this evolution of me using video as a way to share training ideas and connect with people all over the world. And others would try my backyard skill challenges. They'd post their videos and share them with me. And I, I found it to be a really fun way to share all the things I had done over the years that allowed me to literally live my dream, but also just to connect with people. So that was the very early stages of what eventually developed into me wanting to offer a more concrete training program rather than just kind of random YouTube videos with training ideas. Could I offer players something that would be their personal trainer when they go out with their ball on their own, you know, whether it's in the driveway, the garage, wherever players train kind of their backyard, uh, they could follow my training program. So that was the idea for the Techni app. That's great. That's awesome. And I, I flipped through it a little bit in your website, and it's really, really very cool. Wish it was around when I was younger, but. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. they made something that I would have wanted to use as a kid. So yeah, that was the exactly. whole idea. Exactly. That's great. Well, tell us a little bit about then coming back home and joining the National Women's Soccer League and kind of where your head was at at this point. Yeah, so this was around the time I was very, very serious about kind of breaking my way into the US women's national team. I had mm -hmm. been kind of on the periphery and had been invited to some camps, but a big reason I wanted to come home, in addition just to the fact that I wanted to play in the US if there was yeah. a league here, was because I, I wanted to be seen by the national team. And that was still kind of part of my goals that had just were eluding me. And I really, for a long time, a number of years, I was kind of a bubble player on the national team. So I had, I have, 26 caps, which I'm really, really proud of. So yeah. that's what they call the appearances for anyone listening who does, isn't a soccer person. <laughs> but um, but I never really solidified my spot in the way I would have dreamed of doing. But a big piece of why I wanted to come play in the U.S. was for that reason. So I remember that was a huge part of my mindset at the time. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. And you had a big part in creating the association surrounding the Women's Soccer League. Can you talk a, a little bit about that? Yeah, so it's, it was weird because all of a sudden when I came back to play in the U.S., I went from being kind of a, a rookie professional when I left the U.S. to all of a sudden I was a veteran player and I had played in the previous league when a lot of players hadn't. So I, I suddenly kind of saw myself as needing to be a leader in a way that before I, I didn't even realize was it was a thing. And yeah. uh, part of that had to do with the fact that we were close to or just had actually formed a union 
in the very late stages of WPS. And I honestly didn't understand much about it and others had taken the lead to do the work. Mm -hmm. But when that unfolded and we started over with NWSL, really the players ha had no voice or no representation. So myself along with a, a couple other of us oldies at that point, um, <laughs> we decided, you know, this is our job to create something, to create an organization where players can get questions answered, where we have a collective voice and we can speak on behalf of the players and what we need and demand that we are taken care of. I love that. That's incredible. That is like the epitome of a trailblazer. That's incredible. <laughs> well, uh, thank you. I didn't yeah. feel like it at the time, more like just filling a void and a necessity right. actually. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And all the while, um, I know you were kind of battling um, ulcerative colitis. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is? Um, and then what, how, when that you know appeared in your life and kind of what took hold and how you were able to combat that hurdle? Yeah, so I hope everyone listening is unfamiliar with ulcerative colitis <laughs> because it's a very nasty digestive illness. Um, and basically I had known that I had it since I was playing in Sweden, I started to struggle with it at that point. And I came home and saw a doctor. And it's the kind of thing that the way it works is you kind of always have it if you have it, but it can flare up at times or it can yeah. just totally go away. And so I had gone a number of years with no symptoms. I didn't even take any medicine. And then about three years ago from now, I started this flare up and it's very stress related. So now that I look back, I realize the immense amount of stress that's associated with playing a professional sport, um, owning your own business. It was right around the time I started my business yeah. and just all the moves and kind of life upheaval that I've had over the years. Um, I really think it played a huge role, but um, for those people who don't know what it is, it's similar to Crohn's disease and the symptoms, but really uh, for, for I'll spare everyone the details, but I have to use the bathroom very often and very urgently. And it was at one point really, really bad where it made it very tough to leave home. And I was actually in bed for a lot of the days of, for a few months at, at some points over the last couple of years. I'm doing a lot better now, but it's caused me to step away from playing this year. So I'm focusing more on my role with the Players Association, but really just trying to get healthy. And now extra aware of all the stressors in my life, which I think is something that's easy to ignore. Yeah, absolutely. And just a really good mentality to keep in general in mind all the stressors that have happened. And, you know, you've come through all of these hurdles and you seem like such a strong woman. I don't know, because of it or just just in general, tell us what it's like, the mentality, kind of the ups and downs and the roller coasters and what you have to keep in the back of your mind to keep pushing forward. Well, I appreciate that. Some days I don't feel, feel as strong as you're making me sound. Um, I think, you know, I think as athletes, these are the kind of lessons, like I feel so grateful to have learned the lessons that I did through my playing career. And I think it's so similar with uh, starting an organization, running a business, trying to get healthy from an illness. It's that daily attending to your, I call it your craft, but obviously with an illness is not your craft, but it's really a daily grind. And I think that learning to enjoy that daily process is key because you can have those ultimate goals of being a professional athlete, of having this wonderfully successful business, of being in full health. But at the end of the day, you have to live each day of that experience. And for me as a soccer player, a lot of, a lot of it was dealing with disappointment a coach wrong or make a team when I hadn't made it. And uh, similarly with the business, you know, there are struggles and new puzzles every day. And then with my health, same thing every day, my days have been pretty difficult. So yeah. through sports though, I think we all learn, anyone who participates in sports learns that grit. And it really is about the grit to keep going and keep making progress, no matter how small. Some days it can feel like you're barely progressing, but just to keep going and keep making that progress, that's kind of the approach I take to almost everything I do. And I'm very glad that I've had that approach kind of instilled in me because with the health issues, I've really had to rely on it. Oh, I bet. And that progress has now led you to be the executive director. Can you tell everyone a little bit about that? Yeah, so the organization that a few of us as players started, uh, the NWSL Players Association, um, now is at the point where I was actually looking to, I got a little bit of funding and I was looking to hire a part-time executive director for this mm -hmm. year. And then it turned out um, I got things together a little late with the job description and everything, and I couldn't play myself in sure. the season. So I ended up taking that role and 
That's you know, it's a, it's a really big, it's a, I appreciate it. It's a a really big honor and I don't take it lightly that I am representing all of these women who have spent their lives working to be where they are now and who are not recognized enough, are not paid enough and truly don't live the life of what we think of as a professional athlete. So I, I take huge responsibility in order to speak on behalf of those women and to seek opportunities for them and really um, work with the league to progress to a point where the experience for our players is is better than it is now. Hmm. I love that. Well, is there any other advice you have for not only athletes, but women who are going through hurdles, who are struggling, who are struggling to see the light at the end of the tunnel if they are hitting that roller coaster um, and, and just ways to stay positive? Yeah, I think the big thing is to know that that happens to everybody. I think um, it's very easy with social media and media in general to look at others and see these successful, strong people. And every single one of us human beings, especially women, are fighting battles that maybe no one can see. Like on the outside, I look healthy and I show up places and people have no idea what I deal with at home or what it took me to get there. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important that everyone realizes that and realizes they're not alone in whatever struggles they're facing, whether it's uh, working to get the job you want or to be respected in a certain field or to attain that highest level in your field. Um, Everybody has their struggle and has their battle. And while yours might be different than someone else's, I, I think it, it gives me a lot of comfort and to know that I'm not the other, oh, the only one dealing with the ups and downs and confidence and everything that comes along with trying to be great at what you do. So I think just knowing that you're not alone and realizing that no matter what some, somebody else's life may look like from the outside, that we're all dealing with our own struggles and our own battles. So we should support one another in everything we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And that's exactly, thank you so much for coming on this show because this is exactly what I want people to take away from this. So I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much. (laughs) If people want to find out more about you, about Techni, about just your journey, where can they go? Do you have any social handles or websites that you want to share? Yeah, sure. I have my personal website. um, I'll I'll, uh, spell it out, but my (laughs) name is Y-A-E-L-A-V-E-R-B-U-C-H.com. Um, it has links to my personal social media and a blog that I write. Actually, I need to write a new blog post. It's been a while, but I share a lot through that website. It's kind of the hub of all my personal stuff. And then Techni Football, you can see Techni here, and then F U T B O L. If you just search that in social media, we have a lot of fun training content out there for players, and we love supporting players and coaches to not only know what to do in training, but to really feel why it's important and how training at something and seeking mastery can really change your life. That's great. Well, I have one last question for you and it's kind of a weird one. So if you need a second, no, don't, don't worry about it. Um, if I knew you better, what would I ask you? Oh, wow. That is a really <laughs> good question. Um, I think you might ask how it's going with my, uh, my seeking of hobbies. Cause I've yes. always a joke where, um, people are like, you need a hobby. <laughs> like, I don't have <laughs> hobbies because I work all day and my work is like my fun thing. So when yeah. people are like, oh, what do you want to do that's fun? I think of taking out my work. But um, <laughs> so yeah, if anyone has suggestions of hobbies, please find me on, uh, find my website and contact me and let me know. I'm always looking for a hobby that I can do that's actually relaxing. It doesn't take mental or physical energy. So there's yeah. some like restrictions there with ho- the hobbies, but, or maybe shows to watch. I like Law and Order, but I need, I need things to um, take my mind off of my constant grind. Like I talked about that sure. daily grind, I'm always going. So yes, if you knew me and knew my struggles, you would definitely be inquiring as to what I'm doing to relax. And it's not enough, unfortunately. All right. Well, you gave me some good stuff to think about. So I'll, I'll think about that. And anyone watching also think about some good hobbies that are relaxing and fun. And also another good reminder to make sure you have that outlet. I love that. Well, thank you absolutely. so much. Yeah, everyone needs that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. Anything else you want to leave women with or anyone watching with? No, I just think constant progress. Just do what you can each day. And sometimes just getting up and being there is the progress you can make. And I felt that myself. So just um, keep doing your thing and we should all support one another. It's my real message. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Yael. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to The Strack House. We're on all social handles as The Strack House. We'll see you next time.
If you'd like to nominate an inspiring woman, email me at sarahstrackhouse at gmail.com. Thanks for joining. We'll see you next time.